We're here today to talk about bringing autonomy uh, to the sport of hackers to capture the flag. That's Mike Walker, former program manager for DARPA. In 2015, at DEF CON 23, no less, Walker announced the first Cyber Grand Challenge would be held the following year in the same ballroom at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Capture the Flag, if you don't already know, is a popular game among hackers. This time, it would be played autonomously, entirely by machine. Going to take this room, knock down those two air walls next year, make it three times as big, install seats and have a free live event where machines play capture the flag against each other in real time with sports casting visualization imagine a gigantic esports event where all the contestants are machines apart from the e-spectacle of it all cgc in 2016 showed the world what's coming autonomous adversaries and raised serious questions how can organizations react to something that makes decisions in milliseconds How can you still have humans in the loop when reaction time is key? And how can organizations defend or stop something that increases its own cyber capabilities autonomously? Welcome to The Hacker Mind, an original podcast from For All Secure. It's about challenging our expectations about the people who hack for a living. I'm Robert Vimosi, and in this episode, I'm talking about the rise of security automation and what we learned from the first and only Cyber Grand Challenge in 2016. The Defense Advanced Research Agency, or DARPA, periodically hosts these grand challenges that are designed to push technology to the bleeding edge. In its first autonomous vehicle challenge, no entrant finished the race. But the following year, all but one vehicle did. And by the third challenge in 2007, all the vehicles were successfully navigating a model urban landscape without human interaction. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a tremendous rate of technological progress in just a short amount of time. So in 2016, the DARPA Grand Challenge was designed so that cyber reasoning systems, or CRSs, could autonomously scan, verify, and fix software vulnerabilities, all while playing attack and defend, capture the flag against six other machines. Pretty cool, eh? It's important to stress that CGC is a significant event in security. Some of the highest government officials were briefed on this, and it is likely to be affecting cyber defense strategy today. So I have to ask, if autonomous vehicles got three separate challenges, why has there been only one autonomous security challenge? And wouldn't it be exciting to see what would happen next? Or maybe we learned enough from this one Cyber Grand Challenge? When DARPA recognizes that something is coming, they they seem to be pretty astute that some technology is coming up maybe even a decade away or a couple decades away. This is Ned. When Cyber Grand Challenge was first announced, he was still a computer sciences student at Carnegie Mellon University. They tried to get the ball rolling on it so that we could have some kind of competition to create an incentive to have a great system, you know, provide funding for that. And so I think like the ball is rolling. I've seen a lot of excitement in this area, investment and in research in this area. I had wanted to work uh, on the project with For All Secure, basically with uh, the Mayhem team back when I was in school because uh, I was at CMU where that research project started. I started to get an interest in working on Mayhem. And then uh, at some point, it turned into, oh, there's going to be this huge competition and there's going to be CGC. And whenever it was that I heard about that, I think I wanted to try to participate. Uh, you know, At the time they started the Cyber Grand Challenge, CMU and Mayhem were already around and leading the way in terms of you know, automated program analysis and exploit generation. This is Tyler. Prior to working on CGC, he was a researcher in cybersecurity for Carnegie Mellon's Scilab. You know, as soon as it was announced, everyone was, oh, like, look at this. Like, that's basically what they're talking about, right? So I, I don't remember, you know, where we heard about it, but it was, of course, we would have heard about it immediately because, you know, it made sense. Tyler's talking about Mayhem, which in 2014 was not yet a commercial product. It was still a proof of concept for autonomous program analysis. You know, it was originally developed uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, there's a, there are kind of a couple similar iterations to the first one was based off of CLI, which is a open source symbolic executor. So there were some kind of modifications made to that to do exploit generation and stuff like that. So actually for the competition, I didn't personally work on the Mayhem part, but I worked on some of the other you know stuff that took the output of Mayhem and then turned it into an exploit that could be, you know, used. So, yeah, and, and then, you know, it might be a terminology thing, like, you know, mayhem kind of encompasses the whole thing as well, but the symbolic execution part, you know, ties into kind of a whole system. 
So what is symbolic execution and how is it important to software security? It's a way to assign symbols rather than values in order to map out code execution. Perhaps Ned can explain it better. We're starting with a problem, which is we have a binary that's going to run on the computer or some machine, some CPU, and some attacker input is used by the binary to do something. You know, you might have like an image parser that's taking an image from the internet from someone you don't know, and it's trying to translate that into something that can be presented on the screen, for example. And so what symbolic execution does is it tries to generate inputs that cover different parts of the code that's trying to handle the, the input. and. There's different ways you can do this. So you know, people might be familiar with fuzzing. Uh, fuzzing is essentially just picking random inputs and sometimes just looking at what this random input covered and kind of trying to analyze something based on that. But what Mayhem or what Symbolic Execution tries to do is it, it actually models the CPU. So it starts with an input and it starts executing. And when it gets to a, a point where a branch is going to happen, some decision has to be made basically based on the input that's controlled by the attacker. Uh, symbolic execution means we try to actually compute an input that exactly goes one way or the other way. Whereas with fuzzing, we just try to guess until we figure out how to flip one way or the other. Symbolic execution means we try to compute that from a formula. But you can imagine it's like, uh, you know, randomly guessing quickly for an answer versus symbolic execution. Solving the equation is kind of how, how it works. Okay, so DARPA had this grand idea. Let's see if we could automate vulnerability discovery, verification, and remediation. To do that, they needed a proof of concept system, one that nobody else had seen or worked with before. So they created their own OS or operating system for the Cyber Grand Challenge. Partly to make sure everyone was on level playing field, they developed basically a new, not quite operating system, but almost like an operating system that it ran on. And the idea was because it's a completely novel system, no tools that anyone's developed are going to work out of the box. So everyone is going to have to do a bunch of work, get things working with DARPA system. So you can't just say like, oh, well, like those guys already had their thing on the shelf. And they just pull it off and that's how they did it. DARPA's operating system was not entirely created out of thin air. I'm pretty sure it was very closely related to Linux. I think the main thing is that the competition wanted to kind of select for the quality of the, the algorithm or the kind of the search that you were doing. And it wasn't really trying to determine, you know, which team had the best integration uh, with all of the kind of random idiosyncrasies of Linux or another OS. Really, I think they just tried to kind of scope it so that people wouldn't have to spend tons of time with all the menial work that would go into supporting it. I, will, I don't want to say not real, but just like... A, a popular OS. So how did Team for All Secure plan for this? So it's a combination of adapting what we had and then, you know, we, we wrote a lot of new stuff because, you know, one was developed primarily as a research thing for academia and publishing papers versus we had a very specific goal in mind of, you know, getting as many bugs or exploits as possible. The technology is x86, which is what we're working on time. This is Alex Ruber, co-founder of For All Secure and leader of the team at CGC. They had a patching component as well, which we didn't have, but thought we could develop. And so that was great, great timing for us um, because it provided funding to do research and improve the product um, for two years. Remember, CGC is essentially a attack and defend, capture the flag competition comprised entirely of machines. In an ideal world, it would have been exactly the same as like DEF CON CTF, which it wasn't, but it was certainly similar, is certainly kind of analogous in a lot of ways. You get to throw traffic, you know, things are happening in real time, um, all that. Qualification round and the final round were slightly different, but they all followed a similar pattern where you're given a binary, and then you have to find a, a way to crash the, the binary, so what they call proof of vulnerability. Proof of vulnerability is important to understand here. It's not enough that the machine finds a vulnerability. They then have to patch it and share it with the other machines. The qualification, um, they essentially, I think it was like 24 hours or something, and they uh, dumped a number of challenge binaries which we were supposed to feed into our system. And um, the goal was, so it was not attack defense. So I guess in that sense, you could say it's geopathy. Uh, but the goal was to uh, upload a caching input for each change binaries they gave us, as well as um, send a, a patch binary um, that prevented the binary from caching. 
on, on whatever bug we found. Um, and then we were scout on, you know, whether we found the bug, whether we were able to protect the binary, and whether, you know, we retain functionality and performance of the binary when we patched it. That's what they call like consensus evaluation. Consensus evaluation. This too is important. DARPA was checking the quality of the patches that the machines provided. If a machine shared a flawed patch, then they are effectively announcing to the world how they themselves might be vulnerable to attack. Sharing is such a, like, a nice way of putting it. Uh, it was more like if you patch something privately, it would be very, very hard to know if the patch is actually secure or it is secure through obscurity because the other machines didn't know what patch were applied. And to prevent that issue, the competition was done in a way where all the patches were public. So that means if, if Mayhem patched something and did it badly, other machines could analyze our patch and realize that uh, we, we left something that would allow us to exploit it. I think that they improved the quality of the competition because we, we had to now, like we knew that other competitors could analyze our patch. So we had to do a good job. So the qualifier was in 2014, 2015. The final was in 2016. So there are quite a few changes between the the first event and the, and the final event. One of the largest changes was in the qualification round, our goal was only to crash a binary. So, you know, you take a binary and it effectively seg faults, you know, it accesses some out of bounds of memory or something. That's enough. You've you've kind of done as much as you need to do. For the final round, you had to have a more uh, complicated proof of vulnerability. So in addition to crashing the binary, uh, you'd need to control either the instruction pointer. So like demonstrate that you can kind of control the program flow and you'd need to control another register. So you'd need to be able to say this, like, I, I can actually take control of it, not just I can make it do an LD reference or something. So that was a pretty substantial difference. Another difference was for the qualification round, kind of everyone worked in isolation. So our team could operate and everything that we do kind of on its own. Whereas in the final round, produce one of these vulnerabilities, you know, we have to, it'll get sent to another team, which means that now you kind of have this more game theoretic thing where this other team will have visibility into what you did and be able to analyze it. And likewise, we need to have capabilities to analyze other people's uh, exploits. And then you also have to analyze their patches because just because a team made a patch doesn't mean that it works. So there's kind of a lot of stuff with, with that. The final was organized into rounds of challenges, each with their own set of binaries that had to be scanned and patched. I think the actual competition was like eight or 10 hours or something. The way that it was structured, which was also a little bit different from the qualification event, was similar to a normal capture the flag contest. So, you know, the contest starts and there's a certain number of problems available to solve. Those challenges will last for some number of hours. And at some point they go away because their time's up or whatever, and new problems will cycle in and old problems will cycle out and, and so on, you know, over the course of however many hours, eight or 10 or whatever. It was something like 100 on the order of 100 binary is kind of phasing in and out. In a CTF, the winner has the most points at the end. In a Jeopardy-style CTF, the challenges are arranged by theme, with more points awarded to the more difficult problems solved. In an attack and defend CTF, the scoring is much more difficult, since it includes points for defending your box as well as points for attacking others. I think it's good to spend a little bit of time to understand CGC, because a lot of like decisions made during the competition were driven by the scoring system, right? And so the game was split in two hands of five minutes. And during each hand, we would go on the binaries, the challenge binaries that were at play at the time. And um, there were three components to um, the score for each binary. The first one was how many teams did we score again? We sent like an exploit to the six other teams. Um, how many um, of them did we exploit? So that was the first component. The second component is um, did we get exploited by anyone? It's kind of like a defensive um, aspect. And the third component was, if we patch, how much do we have performance and functionality? DAPA, kind of the referees, would run our patch binaries um, against a large number of test cases and compute whether the output changed compared to the original binary. If we made the binary f more than 5% slower, we would start losing a fair amount of points. Um, so the so performance was really important, functioning was very important in our patch. And, and one other thing that was pretty important was that patching was pretty expensive. So you had this hindsight, and, and if you patch on hand N, 
you your service was down on the next hand, on hand N plus one, and you would not score any points on that binary. One of the teams decided that had a strategy that didn't quite work out as well, where they decided to patch everything. And if you look at the scoring system, if you have a challenge binary, it's not going to get exploited by anyone. Somehow, you shouldn't patch it because you lose points because you have that hand of downtime. And then you lose pound point any hand thereafter because you might have broken functionality or you might have made slow. So the optimal strategy, seeing one hand into the future, knowing that an exploit will be thrown and then patching that. Okay, so this is really important. Naturally, you want to patch your vulnerabilities. Otherwise, the bad guys will get in, right? Or maybe they won't because the vulnerability isn't that exploitable and your time could be better spent elsewhere. So there's a cost for patching everything. Team for All Secure took the strategy that they wouldn't patch everything, but they thought maybe others would and perhaps would be wasting their time doing so. In the Cybercon change in the finals, I don't remember how many uh, binaries were actually exploited but it wasn't that many. It was less than half. So what we tried to do strategy was what use indicators we could get from the game state um, to have an idea of, to guess whether we think a binary is being exploited or will be exploited soon. If we find a bug in a binary, you know, two seconds after analyzing it, we, we have a pretty good idea that other teams will find it too. And then we would decide to patch. And so, you know, other teams have different strategy. For instance, you could see the, the game would report to you if, if you're binding cache. So you would know, okay, my binding cache, someone found a bug, but I I don't know if they were able to exploit it to score points, but we thought it was likely that some teams would implement a patch on cache strategy, meaning they see a cache, they're going to think they're exploited, so they're going to patch. And so we try to make other teams make strategic mistakes. So if we if we had a cache on one binary and we couldn't exploit it after a while, we would start sending it out and, and hope that they would you know patch it um, and that would have their, their, their score. Live from the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge final event. So you have to imagine this. Picture a giant Las Vegas ballroom transformed with hundreds of seats all facing an air-gapped stage, upon which sits seven large and very colorful boxes with racks of servers. These are the final round computer reasoning systems. When I say air-gapped, it means that they are physically and operationally disconnected from any outside wireless or cable systems. There is no way for humans to interfere with the autonomous CTF. Occasionally, data is burned onto a Blu-ray disc, and then a robotic arm lifts the disc out of the air-gapped area so that DARPA can score each round and pass some of that information out to the teams. So some of the data that they gave us, you know, we could see like network traffic, for example. And at some point, you know, we were looking at that before, before like the announcers and all that started. So, you know, just while we were kind of sitting there quietly. So we were, we were doing that and we said like, well, this is weird. Uh, You know, like we didn't post any network traffic this round. And, you know, even if we didn't find an exploit for a service, we would at least pretend to send an exploit just to generate network traffic that could confuse other teams because, you know, it's just kind of like game theoretic things. And this is how we play the CTF. So, so it was really strange because we didn't post anything that round. And really, that doesn't make sense because like we unconditionally always post something. So there's, there's clearly a problem here. And then like the next round, you know, it was the same. And the next round, it was the same. We're like, okay, like something's going very wrong here. That was kind of all we could do until the uh, until they started the live announcement stuff, and we had to kind of participate in some of that because you know they were trying to make it interesting. So they'd have interviews with the teams. Welcome everyone to the first ever fully automated cybersecurity competition. So you have to understand that the live audience only came into the ballroom at the end. So like the last two hours and they watched a TV program that was a compressed playback of the day so far, except the team interviews were all done live. That meant the team captains already knew how their machines were actually performing at the moment, even though the TV audience may have been told something else. And so we couldn't talk about what was going to happen in the future because, you know, that would kind of ruin the, the, the vibe, I guess. And so Alex Rebear, as our team captain, was the main person responsible for going up and talking to them. And it was pretty sad because first two rounds, Mayhem's doing great. Like, how do you guys feel? You feeling good? It's like, yeah, great. <laughs> Wonderful. 
In this next scoreboard seven, we will actually see Mayhem overtake Rubius to take first place. So what do you think about the, uh, the current switching back and forth between first and second? Did you expect like a, a close call for the, the lead? Yeah, uh, we expected uh, to have great competition, and we do. Um, we hope that we'll keep, you know, working well like that. Uh, what do you think about being in round, the lead in round 30? You were battling it out with Rubius for a while, and now uh, you've actually firmly taken lead with an 8,000 point lead. Yeah, we're very excited to start building up a lead. The score is from round 60. So you're currently in the lead with a 10,000 point lead. Uh, how are you feeling? Um, we're still excited to be in the lead. Um, so DAPA released the uh, submissions during the competition, and we have been looking at that. And unfortunately, it seemed that our system had a technical difficulty and stopped submitting patches and POVs. Well, I mean, it was incredibly stressful and uh, upsetting. Um, I mean, it's hard for me to know exactly how everyone else was feeling. Uh, they seemed more upset than I did, but I honestly think that that was just a coping mechanism for me. Um, like, I, it was incredibly upsetting to see that something might have been going wrong and that we didn't have enough information to tell why or uh, it was just such a confusing thing because we had been doing so well in the beginning that I think if we had lost because of a small error when we fundamentally had the best approach, it would have been just you know devastating. I mean, I think I think some of the teammates were were on the verge of tears. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, it was it was really frustrating. Meanwhile, you know, some of our friends showed up to start watching, and they're like, "Oh, like how's it going? It looks like it's going great." And we're like, "No, it's going so bad. Like our thing shut down, and we're so screwed. It's not not fun to think about." So. Uh, uh, so we went and we were, tried to talk, talk to some people from DARPA and we're like, you know, something's wrong. Our system is not, there's a, there seems to be something wrong because we would always post something. There's no reason we would ever stop. And aside from this data, the only thing we can do is, uh, you know, the physical machine is there and you can look and see, you know, the power usage and temperature of things inside. So we're like looking at it, it's like, okay, well, like, you know, it's, it's still using a bunch of power, so it's still still thinking real hard. So something's going on, but you're not allowed to access it. It's completely air gap. Uh, you know, there's no there's no network connectivity to get to it. You know, we asked them if we could like reboot our machine or something, because it should you know automatically like reconnect to the network and everything when it comes back. And they said no, no intervention whatsoever. Eventually, the folks from DARPA were like, well, everything looks fine from our end, so it's not our fault. So. Sorry, <laughs> I guess I guess your stuff's broken. Here's Mike Walker in responding to the game pause and request by Team For All Secure to reboot their system. Disaster recovery only happens if uh, there is a hardware-induced or framework-induced failure. And the result of Tim's game pause and audit and all his team's work was there was no hardware-induced or framework-induced failure. Mayhem had simply stopped playing the game and we had to allow it under the full autonomy directive to, to be an autonomous system. And sometimes that means autonomous systems fail. We were, we were pretty upset. As far as we could tell, up to that point, uh, it was doing pretty well. You know, because we could see network traffic and we could be like, oh, this looks like it successfully found an exploit for this service. So it's pretty good. Um, we didn't have any idea what scores were because the scores involve a bunch of calculations about performance and how fast it's running. and the only people who could run it for DARPA. So, you know, we, we saw that and we're like, well, this was a fun two year uh, experiment to end in flames. So that's unfortunate. And, you know, we brought a bunch of like for all secure and mayhem t-shirts or something. So we're like, well, I guess we'll hand them out now while it looks like we're doing really well. You know, at that point we just kind of sat there. They had like a little lounge area with like couches for each team to sit around in. So we we're just kind of sitting there like looking at each other like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> Not that we were doing anything before because we can't touch the system, but you know, it's just like we were we were really hoping we'd uh, do pretty well here. You know, we basically just decided that we must have lost at that point. Remember how we said there was a cost for patching vulnerabilities or even sending exploits? There are points for just sitting there too. So, you know, I, I don't remember the exact timelines, but a little while into the live portion, we started realizing that our score was actually, you know, for the portion where we were working, uh, our score was going up real fast and we started kind of running numbers in our heads saying like, okay, well, you know, being turned off isn't actually the worst thing that could happen. You know, you still get points if you're turned off, just not very many. 
you know, if we get enough points, this might all work out. So, you know, we started kind of doing some back of the envelope math and, you know, slowly we're like, this, this might actually, you know, still work out for us. They keep doing the announcements and like keep, you know, doing the live stream and everything. And then like our friends are like, wait, I thought you said it turned off. Like you still, you're still doing well. What's going on? And like, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's, it's doing okay. I'm not really sure what to say. And then. And now the winner of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge for All Secure and their bot Mayhem. Here's Mike Walker again. I am uh, blown away by what just happened. We just had an all computer hacking tournament. Uh, we computed 96 rounds in a little over eight hours and uh, everything worked. We did very well at the beginning of the game. And, and we got a, a lead that allowed us to carry us for the rest of the competition. The second thing is kind of like a, an artifact of the scoring system. I don't know if it's because the challenge binary has changed or because maybe being out of the game kind of like reduce the number of exploits we would see. But um, there was not that many exploits being thrown around, which means that being down and then patching was actually a pretty good strategy. Because as, as I mentioned, not patching when the binaries are not getting exploited is the optimal strategy, right? Um, and so we, we scored really well on, well, functionality and performance of all of the binaries because we never patched them. And we didn't score that badly on defense because uh, not a lot of work getting exploited. Um, and so that definitely was a one reason why, like the combination of like the scoring system and not seeing a lot of exploits when name was down um, was, was a big reason also why we were able to maintain that lead that we got at the beginning. I, I mean, I think we have a couple random theories about what happened. Part of it is, you know, we, we had no real motivation to capture a bunch of logs because, you know, it happens once and after it happens once, it doesn't really matter. Um, and there's nothing we can do to fix anything. You know, some of the some of the theories we had were it's possible one of the disks in our primary database machine failed, which just made it start going slower. It, it seemed in general that something was just going slow on our end where, you know, we were getting... Like, I forget if, I think we heard from some of the officials that uh, our system was trying to update information for rounds that had already completed. So, you know, it was like round 60 and we were talking about round 58, which, you know, their API would then just completely reject. Um, so for some something was happening where we were getting too much data and we couldn't ingest it fast enough and then we'd process it and we had a backlog and it just got worse and worse. And I think in the in the end towards round I, I don't know whatever somewhere towards one of the last rounds you know some something lucked out where like the you know the one of the problems was uh around long enough that even though we posted about something like 10 rounds old the uh the challenge was still up so, you know, we had some kind of amazing, epic looking thing where it turned back on, although it was just still slow, probably. There, there was some issue that after a sufficient amount of time would kind of bog the system down and just we hadn't had a playthrough that was that long. So it's kind of an interesting thing because, you know, it, it, in the real world, you roll things out really slowly and you test on real traffic and you kind of it's not something that I think would have affected the like a, a real team, you know, this is a really normal issue to have. And then you would d diagnose it and, and correct it. And, but in a competition setting, you know, you don't have that luxury. So, you know, that's the trade-off you make. There's a lot of competitive things in the security field uh, that I've participated in. And um, it can be really exciting, but the, it's, it's just really stressful, you know. Having invested two years of your life in a project such as this, I would think there must be some takeaways. I Actually, this is a great question because I think there's a huge gap between people who believe in automation and people who believe in the human. And so I was actually, I've, I've always had a goal to be doing vulnerability research, you know, real practical research. And what I found was that people on the academic side kind of scoff at things where humans kind of piecing something together. You know, that's not useful research. And, and, and I understand that. And then people on the other side think, oh, well, you know, this system, you know, it's not really 100%. You know, this doesn't work on Chrome. But the truth is, I pulled on a lot of what I learned in academics and in work on automation. And so I actually live now full time, basically this, this uh, using automated tools, plus whatever I can do to help the tool succeed in my day to day work. I think it's 100% a valid area. I think the more we push it, 
the more we can move things towards automation, you know, as the industry picks up on it and it becomes more popular, I think, you know, that'll just kind of happen on its own. For all of us that were working on it, it was, it was just a big kind of culmination. I mean, you know, we'd been working on just for CGC specifically, we'd been working on it for two years and we're a relatively small team. So like a lot of the teams had a couple people kind of work on on and off and, you know, we had other stuff we were working on, but it was probably like 80% of our time had been CGC for like two years. So, you know, it was just so much of our lives had been put into, into the event that just having it work out and having us prove both to ourselves and to everyone else, oh, hey, like we know what we're doing. We know how to do these things. I think that meant a lot to us. Oh, and I should probably mention that Tyler is the team captain for the Plaid Parliament of Poning, or PPP, the all-time grand champion of DEF CON's Capture the Flag. You know, our, our CTF team, PPP, uh, which is, you know, it's a, it's a separate entity, but there's just still a lot of overlap between, between the two groups. You know, we have kind of a reputation or record of, you know, winning lots of CTFs. So to win what is basically the, the largest CTF, whether it's a true CTF is a little bit hard to say, but it's in some sense, it's kind of the biggest CTF, you know, a $2 million prize pool, like two year event, like all this stuff. I, that was kind of a big, again, like some sort of kind of recognition thing. And, you know, co- when you're competing against other groups that include defense contractors and like these big companies who are also trying to do the same thing. And you can say like, yes, we can can compete and hold our own against the best of them. The Cyber Grand Challenge story actually continues when Mayhem came to play the real Capture the Flag at DEF CON the next day against the very human Tyler and Ned and the rest of the PPP team. But that's for another episode. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Hacker Mind podcast today. Until next time, I'm the very human Robert Pomosi for The Hacker Mine.